Sal Romano was my barber. Well, may you ask, what could a barber possibly have to do with sex education? Stay tuned. Sal Romano owned a small, typical two-chair barbershop on Franklin Avenue near President Street. And Sal gave me the first haircut I got when my family moved back to Washington Avenue when I was four years old. And he gave me just about every haircut that I had thereafter until I left the old neighborhood about 18 or 19 years later. Sal was a good guy. Everybody liked him. Sal became a celebrity for a brief time when his nephew, John Romano, made the pitching staff of the Brooklyn Dodgers. There were more pictures of John Romano in uniform in Sal's barbership, barbershop three than John had major league wins, which was zero. Now, as I said, everybody liked Sal Romano. He was a very good guy, but nobody liked to go for a haircut. Because whether you went for a haircut on Saturday or went after school at three o'clock, the time spent sitting in the barbershop was time lost to our usual recreational activities. And there was one absolute no-no. You could never go for a haircut at one o'clock on Saturdays, because at one o'clock on Saturdays, uh, Sal put on his radio to listen to the dreaded Metropolitan Opera. Well, one Saturday it was pouring rain, and a lot of the boys and a lot of their mothers decided this would be a very good time to go for a haircut. So many, many boys went for their haircuts, and the place was mobbed. And unfortunately, on this particular Saturday, Tony, John's assistant, was either on vacation or homesick. So that there we were all sitting in this mob in the barber shop, and the clock was ticking toward curtain time in the Metropolitan Opera. And the boys were becoming more and more antsy. And the barber shop was becoming more and more noisy and chaotic. And Sal was sweating and cursing. And then Sal did an amazing thing. He went to the little room in the back of the barber shop where he had his lunch and hung up his coat and he came out of the room with a stack of magazines and he passed out the magazines one to each boy including the boy already on the barber chair and when i looked at my magazine i saw it was a copy of a magazine called sunshine and health sunshine and health was a magazine about nudist colonies now, don't worry, I knew all about Sunshine and Health. I really knew everything about it. I had never actually seen a copy, but I knew all about it. And it took only a few seconds of looking at this magazine to learn three great truths about nudist colonies and about Sunshine and Health. The first great truth was this. Far more women than men went to nudist colonies. Almost every picture in the magazine was of a naked woman. The second great truth was this. Everything important that women had below the waist had disappeared. It was white, uh, airbrushed out. There was nothing to see below the waist. But the third great truth was this. Nothing above the waist was whited out. There was plenty to see. Now, what there was to see above the waist were dozens and dozens of breasts, dozens and dozens of naked female breasts. And all these breasts were attached to naked female bodies. And these female bodies were leaping at the volleyball net or cavorting in the water or just sunbathing on the beach. And pretty soon, the barber shop, which had been so noisy and chaotic, became very, very quiet. All you could hear was the click, click, click of Sal Romano's scissors 
and the heavy breathing of the boys. And pretty soon, nobody wanted to be next, and nobody wanted to go home, because we loved the barbershop, and we loved Sal Romano. Then Sal did another amazing thing. Usually when a kid finished his haircut, Sal would take his few coins and shoo him out the store. This time, as each boy finished, he was allowed to resume his seat and continue reading until everyone had finished his haircut. Naturally, I got home very late, and my mother was a world-class warrior, and she said, Herbert, I was so worried about you. Why are you so late? I said, Mom, there was nothing to worry about. The barber shop was mobbed, and Tony, the assistant, was homesick. And besides that, Mom, I really did want to hear the first act of Rigoletto. <laughs> that day became known as the Day of the Magazines. And boys who had been present on the day of the magazines, and even some who hadn't been present, would keep asking Sal, Sal, when are we going to see sunshine and health again? And Sal would smile, that shy little smile of his, and say, fellas, I have no idea what you're talking about. Sal Romano, here's to you. When I grew up in the dark and repressive days of the 1940s in Brooklyn, my friends and I thought we were pretty smart and sophisticated about matters of sex. We weren't. We were very ignorant. We were so ignorant that we thought lychee nuts was a venereal disease. We were so ignorant we thought Moby Dick was a venereal disease. We were so ignorant that we thought hormone is what a prostitute did to encourage her John. Okay, enough of the groaners. When I was about 11 or 11 and a half, I was rummaging through my mother's dresser drawer one day. In those days, I did a lot of rummaging. I never stole anything, but I rummaged. Now, one day when I was rummaging, I came upon a very official looking pamphlet. And the title of the pamphlet was, How to Tell Your Children the Facts of Life. Well, I was anxious to learn the facts of life, so I was very dis excited about making this discovery of this pamphlet. And without even trying, I was so excited that this led to my first good news, bad news joke. The good news was, my mother was going to tell me the facts of life. The bad news was, my mother was going to tell me the facts of life. How could I explain that to my friends that my mother taught me about sex? I didn't have to worry. She chickened out. She never said a word. As a matter of fact, one day when I came home from school, I passed the living room where my mother was playing mahjong with the girls. And just as I passed the living room, I heard her say, but I never told him. Now, all these years, I always assumed my mother meant she never told me the facts of life. It could be, though, that she meant she never told my father how she skimmed money off her grocery allowance so she could buy things for herself without asking for extra money. Well, now I realized my mother was not going to be a source of sex education. And in, the, in those days, schools definitely didn't teach sex education, especially in a place like Brooklyn, where the Catholic Church was so powerful. But believe it or not, even in those dark days, there were politicians, educators, medical people who really advocated that schools ta start teaching sex education. The mantra of these groups was, it's far better that your children learn about sex in school rather than in some back alley. Well, the truth of the matter is, I learned about sex in a back alley. One day, and I don't remember exactly how old I was, Alan Crystal, who was the oldest one of my friends, he was two and a half years older than I was, invited Bernie Roston, who was one and a half years older than me, into the alley behind 921 Washington Avenue. And there, 
Al and Crystal told us how babies were made. The whole thing was so shocking that I hardly remember exactly what Alan said, but I certainly do remember the question that Bernie Rostin asked him. I certainly do remember Alan's answer, and I certainly do remember my very inane comment on all of the proceedings. When Alan finished explaining the facts of life, Bernie said, but Alan, what do you do when it's all over? And Alan said, Bernie, I can't believe you're asking me that question. You take it out. What do you think you do? Well, Alan was right. You take it out. That's the answer. Now, while my comment was very stupid, I really believe that at that time and that place, many boys would have said or at least thought the same thing. When Al and Crystal finished telling the facts of life and how the whole process worked, I said, not my parents. Anyway, I now had some fundamental knowledge about the facts of life. That didn't mean all my anxieties and worries were over with. I had a new area of concern, the big M, or as it was called in polite society, self-abuse. I'm sure you all know what I mean. Don't get me wrong, I wasn't looking for any information on how to do the big M. I figured that out myself. It was working out pretty well. What bothered me were all these damn rumors I kept hearing. And the first rumor I heard was too much participation with the big M would lead to hair growing on your palm. When I first heard that, I was really upset, but I calmed down and I started thinking clearly. If hair grew on my palm, I could still hold a spoon, I could still hold a fork, I could still hold a pen or a pencil, I could still play punch ball or stick ball. There was only one downside I could see to hair growing on my palm, and that was this. If my mother saw the hair, she would know I wasn't locking myself in the bathroom to read the Reader's Digest. The second rumor was much worse for boys. And that wasn't a slip of the tongue when I said boys. Everybody knew that the Big M was strictly for boys. Girls didn't participate at all. Girls didn't have anything to do with the, BM, the Big M. Why should they? How could they? Anyway, the second rumor I heard was that too much participation could lead to blindness. This was scary stuff. It was so scary that somebody actually created a joke about it. And this was the joke. The mother says to her son, Johnny, you must stop that nasty hair, ha uh, habit right now. Must stop it right now Otherwise, you're going to go blind. And Johnny says, Mom, is it okay if I keep going till I need glasses? <laughs> anyway, when I heard this rumor, I became very proactive. And what I did was this. At least once a week, I found myself in the back of the classroom at PS241. And when I was in the back of the classroom, I checked to see if I could still read the a blackboard in the front of the room. And if I could still read the blackboard in front of the room, I knew I was safe for at least another few days. While this was all going on, I heard a strange conversation. It was between my friend George Loeb, who was the only one of my crowd who was in the Boy Scouts, and another kid whose name I can't remember. And George Loeb was telling this boy that if he joined the Boy Scouts and got, got hold of the Boy Scout handbook and he looked on page 418, all his questions and worries about the Big M would be answered. Now, when I heard this conversation, I was about halfway through serving my sentence in the Cub Scouts. And I figured with time off for good behavior, I'd be finished with the Cub Scouts in a couple of months and I could join the Boy Scouts and get the handbook. And that's just what I happened. What happened? 
I joined Troop 156, which met in a couple of rented rooms above a storefront synagogue on Flatbush Avenue. And when I joined the Boy Scouts, my mother went off and bought me the Boy Scout shirt, the Boy Scout neckerchief, my parents wouldn't spring for the Boy Scout hat and the Boy Scout pants, but most important, my mother got me the Boy Scout handbook. And when she brought it home, I hid it under my pillow. And when we all went to sleep, I forced myself to stay awake. And when I was sure my parents were sound asleep, I put on the light, I turned to, took out the Boy Scout handbook and turned to page 418. And you talk about disappointments. That was the greatest disappointment of my life. First of all, I really expected a lot from this book. If you wanted information about the Big M, what could be a better title of a book than the Boy Scout Handbook? The Boy Scout Handbook. Anyway, I turned to page 418 and I expected the title of the section to be the Big M or some colloquial variation on the Big M. The title of the section was Conservation. I always thought conservation meant planting trees, but conservation in this context meant abstinence. And this section of the Boy Scout Handbook was probably written by Colonel Jack D. Ripper of Dr. Strangelove fame because it was basically about preserving your precious bodily fluids. Instead of trying to paraphrase the Boy Scout Handbook, I'm going to read, read it to you. <laughs> this is my Boy Scout Handbook from the 1940s. Wow. And the section, as I said, was entitled Conservation. It came right after sections on athlete's foot, care of the fingernails, and pain. The Boy Scout Handbook was talking in this part about nocturnal emissions, and this is what it said. This discharge is called a seminal or nocturnal emission. It may be accompanied by a dream. It is perfectly normal experience. It goes on to say how often this might happen, and it's, then the Boy Scout Handbook says, they are natural but no step should be taken to excite seminal emissions. This is masturbation. It is a bad habit. It should be fought against. It is something to be kept away from. Keep control in sex matters. It is manly to do so. It's important for one's life, happiness, efficiency, and the whole human race as well. My friends and I couldn't believe this. We couldn't believe that the Boy Scouts were telling us this. The chapter went on to say, seek advice from wise, clean, strong men. So a bunch of the new Boy Scouts and I decided to talk to the Scoutmaster about whether this chapter was true or false. The Scoutmaster was not some 50-year-old pedophile, but a young Eagle Scout who had just gotten his master's degree. And we said to him, is this stuff the real thing? He said, absolutely it is. And not only is abstinence all the things that the book said it was, but it's also patriotic. Oh my God, abstinence was patriotic. Now I had a whole new worry. Did that mean that every time I locked myself in the bathroom, I was helping the Nazis? Despite my best efforts to be non-unpatriotic, the Nazis lost the war, hair never grew on my palm, I never went blind, everything turned out very well. Now, it was time to buy my first condom. Well, you may you ask, what is an overweight Jewish boy in Crown Heights, not far removed from his bar mitzvah, not far removed removed from wearing high-top orthopedic shoes, why does such a boy need a condom? Well, I'll tell you. All my older friends 
told me that I should have a condom with me at all times in case I ever got lucky. Now, they didn't use that expression. Getting lucky was not an expression used at, the, at that time, but I knew what they meant, and so do you. But I was always kind of a rational young guy. Sometimes Iris says I said I was too rational, but I knew I would never, ever get lucky with the girls in my class. I knew that I would never, ever get lucky with the girls in the neighborhood. And the reason was quite simple. How could you get lucky with girls that you never talk to? But I had a plan. I had a plan about getting lucky, and I have to explain that to you. Urban mythology has it that young males hang around candy stores. Well, we didn't have a candy store in my neighborhood. We had a drug store. It was Doc Shapiro's drug store, and that's where my friends and I hung around. To digress for a second, a few years earlier, Doc Shapiro had bought the drugstore from Doc Berenson, who was the father of Willie Berenson, who was one of my close friends. I was the kid who was always picked last for athletic events. Willie Berenson was the kid who was always picked second from last in athletic events, so he and I were pretty close. Doc Shapiro provided a service to his customers. He would deliver. He would deliver prescriptions. He would deliver toiletries. He would even deliver a pack of cigarettes. And he used some of the Montgomery Street boys as delivery boys. And that worked out very well. The customer got his order very quickly. Doc Shapiro got brownie points for his good service, and the boy delivering the product got a tip. So here was the plan. One day, Doc Shapiro would ask me to deliver to one of the apartment houses in the neighborhood. And when I rang the bell, the door would be answered by a sad and lonely housewife. And she would invite me in for milk and cookies, and then nature would take its course. It never happened. It never came close to happening. But I had a more practical problem now. Where should I buy my first condom? I was very nervous about this. It made sense to buy it from Doc Shapiro, but Doc Shapiro was very friendly with my mother, and I could just picture my mother showing up in the drugstore to buy some mascara or something, <clears throat> and Doc Shapiro saying to her, you know, Matilda, Herbert bought a Trojan last Tuesday. I learned from my Catholic friends that priests made a deal. They never told anything, but I didn't think that rule applied to pharmacists. Well, anyway, all things considered, I decided to buy it at Doc Shapiro's. So one day I got up my courage, took some money out of my sock door, and went into the pharmacy. And naturally, there were several customers there. So I hung out at the magazine rack for a few minutes till the customers left. Then I went to the back counter where Doc Shapiro sold his prescriptions. And Doc said to me, Fink, what could I do for you? Fink was my maiden name, by the way. I said, Doc, I need a bottle of aspirin some Band-Aids, and a little. Now, Doc was a good guy. He was a good guy like Sal Romano was a good guy. And he said, tell me, Fink, do you need one or a three-pack? A three-pack. So I pretended to think for a couple of minutes, and I said, Doc, I'll take one this time. I'll get the three-pack the next time. So I bought my very first Trojan, and I did what every single boy I knew did. I took out my wallet, put the Trojan into the wallet, closed up the wallet. And after a, about a week or so, there was a faint outline of a circle on the wallet. And after about a month or so, the circle had become very clear and well-defined, and everybody knew what that circle meant. So when I got to school, I took out my wallet, and I would flash it at all the boys who had been flashing their wallets at me. Hey, Barry, check it out. And Barry would flash his wallet back at me, and we would each give each other the thumbs up. 
Well, now my condom was waiting in my wallet. And like the refugees in Casablanca, it waited and waited and waited. Much time passed. I don't even remember how much time. And one day, for reasons that I can't remember, I decided to check out my condom. And I opened it up, and there was nothing there. All that was there was a little pile of latex powder. I was very lucky that I never got lucky. <laughs> Final chapter. Somewhere around the end of high school, my friends and I started hearing about something mysterious. It was called oral contraception. We had no idea what oral contraception was. We had no idea how it worked. We had no idea how to find the answers to these questions. But finally, when I was in college, I found out what oral contraception was and how it worked. I was on a date with Iris, and I said to Iris, Iris, would you consider going to bed with me? And Iris said no. That's how I found out what oral contraception was. The end.